The year is 1545. It's the afternoon of the 19th of July. The last few days have been calm, but today there is a stiffening breeze and that calmness is about to be shattered. The French fleet is making its way towards Portsmouth. A battle is about to begin. At South Sea Castle, King Henry VIII sits astride his horse, looking out across the Solent to where he can see his favourite ship, the Mary Rose, advancing to engage with the French fleet. He watches proudly as she fires a broadside towards a French galley. Immediately, she begins to turn, making ready to fire again with the guns on her other side. But there's a problem. As she turns, she's heeling over too far. Henry sits motionless. She's capsized. The Mary Rose is sinking and sinking fast. Four days later, Henry's Lord Privy Seal, Lord Russell, wrote, I am very sorry of the unhappy and unfortunate chance of the Mary Rose, which should be in such ways cast away with those that were within her, which is a great loss of the men and the ship also. Notwithstanding, ye give me good hope that the ship shall be recovered, which I pray God may be so. Well, of course, those prayers were answered and the ship was recovered, but not until nearly 500 years later, on the 11th of October, 1982. But this is not going to be a history lesson. This is the first in what we hope will be a series of podcasts from the Mary Rose Museum, where we introduce you to some of the people at the museum who have a fascinating and detailed understanding of the story of the ship, its objects and the crew. The first of these is Christopher Dobbs. Chris is a maritime archaeologist who dived on the wreck and was there on the day that the ship was raised from the seabed. He personally found hundreds of the objects that are on display in the museum and was responsible for developing much of the way in which those objects and the ship are now displayed. Chris has lived and breathed the Mary Rose project for over 40 years. What he doesn't know about the Mary Rose, nobody knows. Now, obviously, in the current situation we find ourselves in, we're recording this remotely. So let's click on the link and contact Chris at his home. Hi, Chris. Great to talk to you. Let's then go back to that day in 1982 when the ship was raised. What are your most ab abiding memories of, of that moment in time, such a special moment? Well, it really was a special moment. And we found out later that 60 million people were watching it around the world. Uh, but I don't think we realised uh, how much fuss was being made until we actually came ashore and the ship was towed into the harbour and all these sirens were sounding and people were, it was at night, so people were flashing flashlights and there was cheering and, and, and clapping. And just to see so many thousands of people on the seafront at Portsmouth um, as she came into the harbour was, I think it, it's only then that we realised quite what we had achieved, but it had, it had certainly been a long, very long day uh, and a very long year, in fact. You were actually in the water on the day, weren't you, Chris? You were in, in, in your wetsuit uh, diving away. <laughs> uh, actually, dry suits in those days. Uh, <laughs> we were, we'd, uh, for, the, for the salvage diving, we were using professional diving equipment. We'd all retrained to the full offshore commercial standards like you have in the North Sea. So we had dry suits and uh, helmets and an umbilical to the surface, uh, a system of diving called surface demand, whereby you're, you're completely linked with the surface. But yes, it, it was an amazing day and I was actually underwater as the Mary Rose left the seabed and came to the surface. So it was just an extraordinary privilege. I was working, filling up um, these airbags that we used to cushion the hull on the day and um yeah just uh, an amazing day really yeah i can imagine i can imagine but of course on that day had there been a big lead up to that hadn't they fixing the cradle and and so on and so forth what was the build up to it like well it was really that whole summer of 1982 uh we were working out there in the solent uh we started in about march and uh again at that time, you may remember it was the Falklands War. And so all of those vessels going out to the Falklands would moor up just beyond us in the Solent before they went out. And we were spending that whole summer diving. 
And I mean, I, I think an even more memorable guide than that one uh, when the May Rose actually came up was one at about three in the morning a week earlier when the Mary Rose had just been raised from the seabed using a series of jacks. It was a really clever operation that the civil engineers organized. So the first part of the raising, the first few inches, was actually done over many hours, in fact, a couple of days, just to get the hull off the seabed. And I went in at about three in the morning when this had just been achieved to uh, look at the hull and, and survey it and see what condition it was in. And it was just absolutely stunning because the whole hull was off the seabed, held up by the wires that we put in for salvage. And it was just swaying in the current, just swaying like in the breeze. And I put my hand on the hull and could feel the whole hull just moving very, very gently. And to me, that's when it came alive. It was, we knew at that stage that the whole hull, or the whole, the part of the hull that was left was absolutely in one piece and would be ready for the lift a few days later and mm -hmm. uh, i think that was a very moving moment yeah i can imagine what, what's it like diving in in the water at three o'clock in the morning i mean presumably you have lots of lights do you so you can see what's going on well it wasn't it doesn't really make that much difference because it was so dark down there that year and having done you know a thousand dives or more on the wreck you know every inch of it but for that um, particular dive, I did take lights in with me because the whole dive was filmed. And in fact, it took me about 40 minutes to get into place and then the lights blew. And <laughs> I had to go all the way back up to the surface and uh, get the lights changed and then drag them all down again because I'd have my own umbilical and the, uh, the camera cable, the lighting cable. So I had to drag those all into place. But well, what I did is to um, point the camera at the hull, but because you couldn't see it was moving, I actually put a, an iron bar into the seabed next to the hull, and then you could just see that the whole hull was swaying. Yeah, because it was it was swaying relative to this iron bar that was stuck in the seabed, and and that as you know that that's the moment that proved that the, the ship was in one piece and ready for the final lift. And in fact, it was it was even more extraordinary than that because. As the ship moved, you can just imagine a ship just above a jelly mold, exactly the same shape as the ship, where we'd raised it off the seabed. So it was just a couple of inches clear. And as the ship sort of swayed, the water would come in on one side of the ship. And then as the ship swayed back again, sort of squashed itself back against the side of the, um, the jelly mold, uh, a puff of silt would just puff up of the, the way the water was moving and it was it literally was puffing like a dragon and especially <laughs> having having this light underwater light it sort of gives very very uh, direct light from one angle and you could see it was almost as if the ship was breathing as silt puffed came in one side and puffed out the other side um again really quite surreal and perhaps it was heightened by being three o'clock in the morning and um and and knowing that this uh this, this whole Tudor ship, you know, 500 years old, was just gently swaying underwater, moving for the first time for 500 years, well, 437 years. Yeah, amazing. Um, but amazing. there were so many memories like that. It was just, yeah. just unbelievable. Um, so talking of your memories, Chris, obviously you spent, I think it was something like three years diving on the wreck and doing the excavations of the objects and so on. And it strikes me that it would be very interesting to hear a couple of stories about diving for the objects. Well, I mean, I think the diving was, was so amazing because you just did not know what you were going to find next. On every dive, you might find something different. And it was because it was so exciting. I think that's why we had such a wonderful um, labour force of volunteer divers. We had over 500 divers who spent their, their weekends and their holidays to dive on the wreck to help us with the excavation but I, I think it was this idea that you didn't know what you would find next that made it so exciting for them. Yeah I'm, I'm sure. So going back then to the objects what for example do you think is the most important object that you found? That's a, that's a great question I think the most important to me is the chests that we found. Maybe I'm cheating with the question because that's more than one object but I think it is a, <laughs> I, I think a, we a chest. 
<laughs> because and then if we just take you know one particular example of a chest but these chests um it was something that i was very involved with because i thought it was important to try and raise them in one piece so rather than excavating them underwater my idea was to place them in a modern box and then excavate them on the surface because only because you could spend more time over it sure. and they're great because they're 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 time capsules within a time capsule or they all belong to just one person so by looking at the contents of one chest it's almost that you can get to know the person who owned that chest you know, that you'd, you'd know whether they were learned you know they might have book covers books didn't survive but the book covers did um they might be quite rich they might have a few coins uh, they might have the, the latest um, fashion accessory, the latest eye watch of the time, which was a pocket sundial. Um, and, and then they might have some professional objects in them as well, like the tools of a master carpenter. And to get all these different objects in one place, we, we've, we've got the, the jewels and the jewel box. And then on top of that, we've got the jewel box of the ship herself. So I, I think the chests are, are really important. I know my colleagues might say, the guns or the musical instruments or something but but to me it was those personal chests that give us insights into the lives of individual sailors from 500 years ago yeah sure i can understand that um so is there any one of those that for any particular reason has a great personal meaning for you um personal uh, yeah i think for personal meaning it would it's probably a bit of an unusual object to choose because it's so extraordinarily ordinary. But it was a shovel that I found down in the um, storage area of the ship. And I found it at the beginning of a dive and I decided that I would excavate this myself. So I excavated this shovel, it's a wooden shovel. And it, it was so beautifully made out of one piece of wood. So it was carved out of a cleft piece of oak. So it's been split from a tree. So the grain ran exactly down the whole shovel. So the blade and the handle and the shaft were all made of one piece of wood. And I just remember this particularly because after excavating it and uh, you know surveying it into the uh, site grid system, um, I held it up in my hand and it suddenly struck me that the, the last person who touched this was a Tudor sailor. And I suppose it has, personal meaning to me because it was it was the one object that, that had that effect on me and I don't know why it wasn't you know one of the other stunning objects we had but it, it was it was so so functional and so beautifully made and it, it helped me in a very strange way connect with someone from from the Tudor period. Yeah I can understand that and I mean those personal stories are the things that are told so well in the museum as well so uh, they're very important all round. So Chris, is there one particular object among all those many thousands of objects that you can simply say, this is my favourite, this is the one I want to show you? I think my favourite would have to be, again, it's a very um, ordinary object, but it, it's a shoe that we have in the museum that's completely worn through uh, on the sole. And when you, when you see it, you can just empathize with that Tudor sailor who had this shoe. He probably had a foot condition, which meant that the, the shoe wore out in that particular place quicker than anywhere else. But it, 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 it's this idea that, that it can help visitors to imagine themselves in the shoes of uh, a Tudor sailor and imagine the, the pain, imagine what it was like. And some of them wouldn't have had shoes at all, but I, I think it it brings it home to us quite how extraordinary the Mary Rose collection is, that it, it has objects from every class of society. I mean, we've, we've even got peppercorns and plum stones and the ends of laces. Um, it's quite extraordinary. Yeah, and talking of things like that, plum stones and peppercorns, they utterly surprise me that they have survived. Is there one particular object or set of objects that you look at every day and think, how on earth has that survived? <laughs> well, I think a number of rosary beads that we had, a number of sets of rosaries, because you wouldn't have expected them to survive because you had no idea that the sailors would have had them on board. Mm. Um, you know, rosaries have been banned by Henry VIII. 
1538 or so. You weren't allowed to use them to say your prayers. And soon after the May Rose sank, uh, a couple of years later, you, you, they were completely banned. And if you had one, you'd be punished. And yet, yet we've got eight or nine of them on the Mary Rose. And this is, this is the king's ship. This is the, the whole ship um, and the ship's equipment actually belonged to Henry VIII himself. And yet these sailors are praying in a way that, um, you know, a Catholic way, you could say, that they were brought up with. And, and it shows you that if, if they'd been praying that way for 20, 30 years, they weren't going to change the way they prayed just because the king was, was breaking with Rome and so on. And so it, it, they're wonderful, tactile, functional objects that also have real insights into the enormous turmoil going on in Europe in the middle of the 16th century and that, that's why I think they're the most surprising to have survived because had it not been for the disaster of the Mary Rose, the sort of Pompeian-like disaster that preserves everything, whatever the value, whoever it belongs to, whether it was illicit or something you were allowed to have, uh, it's, it's, it's those sort of calamities that can give us an insight into one day in history. And that's what the Mary Rose does. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. I know that, I mean, obviously there are some 19,000 objects that were discovered and a huge number of those are on display in the museum, thousands of them. Apart from those, I mean, obviously there's the ship itself. What, what makes the museum so special for you? How come, you know, you've, you've hung around the Mary Rose for over 40 <laughs> years, Chris? You know, what, what makes it such a special thing for you? I, I think it's... It's and what what makes the museum special is that uh, there are all these extraordinary objects, and we've we've discussed some of them. But the great thing is that every visitor who goes to that museum will have their own favourite. If you ask a busload of thirty people who've just visited the museum, they'll probably all come up with a different favourite object, and that just shows how it can appeal. I would say that there's something in that museum that could appeal to everyone in the world. You know, whether it's whether it's a, a comb, a knit comb, like modern knit combs, or some of the food that they never ate because the ship sank, there are things that could interest every visitor, and can be special, personally special, every visitor. You know, and that's why I think the museum as a whole is so special. I have to agree with you. I think it's an incredible collection, and the the way in which it's displayed for visitors is universally popular. I think it is a great place. Obviously. We're currently under this lockdown situation, Chris, and the museum is therefore closed. But while the museum is closed, work still carries on inside to make sure the objects and the ship itself are kept in good condition. Can you just tell us a little bit about what is still having to be carried out? Yes, even though the May Rose is closed, the, the May Rose Trust has a duty of care for the collection. And not just the ship, but all the objects have to be kept in a very stable environment with controlled temperature and humidity. And obviously all this air conditioning and temperature control is expensive. And Dr. Schofield and her team have to go in and make sure that all these systems are functioning. The museum is expensive to run. As we're an independent museum that doesn't get taxpayers' money, we've still got to raise as much funds as we can. We need to keep the ship and the collection in fantastic condition so that when the visitors come back they can enjoy the hull and the objects and this insight into Tudor life once again and in fact for future generations to do the same. Chris that's a great way for us to finish I think. Thanks so much for your time today it's always inspiring listening to your memories and insights into the museum and its collection. Let's hope the doors can reopen again soon. Thanks a lot Chris. We hope you've enjoyed listening to this podcast. Keep a lookout on the website for details of reopening and other events, and of course, future podcasts. Thank you for listening, and stay safe.